want to welcome everyone to From the Preacher Study. This is a podcast that I do along with Kevin Clark. My name is Bob Hutto. I'm the preacher here at the Oak Mountain Church of Christ. Kevin Clark, uh, my colleague, is a member here at uh, Oak Mountain, and uh, we've been doing this podcast for a good long while now. We're working through the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. We've worked our way through the Beatitudes, sort of one by one. Now we're uh, progressing beyond that, looking at some of the other material in the Sermon on the Mount, some of the greatest teaching, well, ever done by anyone, actually. And so it's well worth our while, even if we've studied it many times before. It's well worth our, our time and our effort to go through it again, uh, re- renew uh, the what we've learned before, remind ourselves of what we've learned before, maybe new, uh, learn some new uh, aspects of it or new ways that it might apply in our lives. And so, again... Uh, it's ever new, really, to uh, someone who loves the scriptures and uh, wants to study and learn as much as they can. And so it's always, always new. We appreciate uh, people being with us. Hope that uh, if you don't have your Bible with with you, at least you're familiar with the passage or listen closely to the things as we uh, discuss them uh, in this episode of uh, From the Preacher's Study. We're glad you're with us. Amen. Kevin, any introductory comments today? Yeah, I, I love this teaching because of the, the focus and the emphasis on the heart. And, you know, a lot of times when we talk about morality, we think about behavior and regulating mm-hmm. behavior and restricting behavior. But Jesus makes it clear that the focal point for the servant of God is to get the heart right on all of these various issues. And once you get the heart right, then the right conduct will flow from that automatically. So it's really not enough to restrict or regulate actions or behaviors, but get behind what is the the, the root of those actions and behaviors. Get that heart right, and then everything is going to flow. And if you look at several of these things, it really is talking about the heart. Now, there'll be some physical manifestations of the heart, right. and he'll talk about that. But the emphasis is to look within, get the mind right, get the heart right, get the affections right. right. And once you have that, then in each of these areas, you will demonstrate righteous conduct. And so I think that's, that's pretty right. uh, powerful. And it's the beginning, really, for a Christian's walk with God is to examine yourself, see if your heart is right. It really starts with a penitent heart, recognizing that you're in need of a Savior, you're sinful, and you, you have violated God's will and you're bound for hell. And so you have that contrition, and then you are made a child of God through obedience, and then you still need to be working on that heart. Really right. a lifelong endeavor, but that, that's what's so important in Jesus' kingdom is getting the heart right with God and your fellow man. That's right. That's right. And that leads into what we want to talk about in, right. in this study. Right. We're glad to have Jason Reed and yes, Mark Townsend yes, with us. very much so. They're uh, doing all the technical work behind right. the scenes, but uh, we sure want to give them credit right. for the work they do and their families that enable them to, to come and be with us. And so we Amen. appreciate their work. Amen. And so in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus sort of transitions to, I think it's a a new section of Mm -hmm. the Sermon on the Mount. Not that it's unrelated to what's gone before, but but sort of transitions to a new section. He says, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes were that group of men who copied the law, so they become experts in the law, very knowledgeable of what the law had to say. And so they become advisors and leaders themselves. But let's talk about who the Pharisees were mm-hmm. a little bit. The Pharisees are, uh, they, they're they not known in the Old Testament. They don't develop until that time between the book of Malachi and Matthew. Uh, but they're a sect of the Jews. Judaism in Jesus' day was divided up into different groups. The Pharisees were one group. You had Sadducees, you had Essenes, and maybe a few others as well. And they had their own interests. They had uh, their own goals and what they thought was important, what they wanted to achieve and accomplish. It's interesting, which one of those groups did Jesus belong to? He didn't belong to any mm, of them, no, did he? No, and so no, you could no. be a Jew and not belong right. to any of that's those right. those groups. Hmm, that's an interesting <laughs> thought, isn't it? And so you uh, uh, can be simply a Christian hey, as well yeah, today, right. can't you? Not that's be right. no, any, be a, any group. Yeah. Uh, other than simply a Christian. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's maybe a subject for a different (laughs) lesson. But uh, anyway, so Jesus says you have to, your your righteousness must surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. The Pharisees 
as described in the New Testament, mm -hmm. uh, they had some serious problems. Absolutely. Jesus in Matthew 23 right, describes right. them as hypocrites. Right. Uh, he says in that same chapter, Matthew 23, the be beginning of this chapter, whatever they, whatever they say to you, do, but mm -hmm. don't do as they do. Right. Because they say and do not do. They, mm -hmm. they don't practice what they preach. Right. That's part of what made them hypocrites. They bound human tradition as if it were the law of God. Right. It wasn't the law of God. Its origin was with men. But they would bind tradition as if it were the law of God. I've heard and read uh, the tradition uh, was meant to act like a fence yeah, yeah, around yeah, right. uh, maybe around a piece of property, a right. uh, fence around the law. Why would you build a fence around your property to keep what's in the property from getting outside the boundaries of the property and to keep right. what you don't want inside out? Mm -hmm. And so the tradition may be a good, uh, maybe a, a good motive to keep people from getting outside the bounds of the law. But the traditions of men are not to be equated and given the same strength and authority as the law of God. We, we need to recognize that as Amen. well. Amen. They made void the law of God by mm -hmm. their tradition. Mm -hmm. in, in Luke, uh, Luke says that they were lovers of money. Mm -hmm. uh, in Luke 16, verse 14, they were self-righteous. Luke 18 and verse 9, they rejected God's purpose for them in not being baptized according to John's baptism. And so by uh, refusing that, they rejected God's purpose for them. Uh, they seem to be more concerned about externals, mm -hmm. external, uh, the appearance of being righteous and so forth, uh, and uh, the measurable. What I mean mm -hmm. by that, mm -hmm. you remember the story of the two men that went down to pray, right, one right. a publican, one a Pharisee. Right. And the Pharisee seems interested in, I fast twice a mm -hmm, week. Mm -hmm. I give a tenth. I give tithe. I'm able to measure that. And so mm -hmm. in their minds, it seems that instead of righteousness being a matter of the heart, which is immeasurable, mm -hmm. they're interested in the, what you can measure right. uh, and externals. Um, sometimes people might suggest that the Pharisees were really strict about keeping the law. Right. Not really. Mm -hmm. uh, God, Jesus says, now you'll set aside the law of God to keep your tradition. They were strict about keeping the traditions. Right, right. Uh, but not quite so meticulous in their keeping keeping the law. And so that, that's, that, that, they're sort of the foils in the story, mm -hmm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. That Jesus kind of reacts to them and he teaches uh, in opposition to them. Uh, in in the Gospels. Paul refers to him in Acts 26, verse 5, as mm -hmm. the strictest sect mm -hmm. of the Jews. So we have to ask ourselves, can we become like the Pharisees? Could we become like them, where we bind our tradition as if it were the law of God? We're lovers of money or more interested in externals than developing the heart, uh, that we become hypocrites and say and do not practice what we what we teach. That's possible, isn't it? It's absolutely possible. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why First Timothy four sixteen Paul encourages Timothy, a young preacher, he says, "Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine, for in doing this, we will save both yourself and those who hear you." He makes that connection between the teaching and how you live. If there's not a consistency there, you lose credibility. And certainly, the Pharisees had lost a lot of credibility uh, with righteous people who could see that difference. And Jesus pointed that out. Now, I will say one small redeeming thing for them is that we remember the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. Yeah, that's right. He was and obviously Pharisee. He was a good person in terms of his sincerity, sincerely wrong until he right. encountered the gospel and obeyed. But that, that may be one highlight for the Pharisees, but you're right. In general, well, Jesus has some very harsh things. I think things there are probably others as well. Right. Nicodemus right. was a Pharisee. That's right. That's right. He came to Jesus by night, and he had some interest in yep. learning about Jesus. And we read about Nicodemus in a positive way we do. on we do. into the book of John yep. as well. And yep. so... And so we're painting with a broad brush. I'm right. sure there were exceptions to, That's right. to the, the description that we've pulled out here. But Jesus says our righteousness must exceed, mm -hmm. must, must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And then I think what he does is he gives us some illustrations. Let right. me show you what I mean by that. Right. Uh, he uh, addresses six different ideas or topics, introduces each one of them with a statement like, you've heard that it was said, mm -hmm. or something like that. Sometimes in that, he might quote the law. Sometimes mm -hmm. he might just quote, a, you know, a kind of a, a commonly held position on right. the law. 
uh, maybe tradition or something like that. But this is what people have been saying. Mm -hmm. But this is what I say to you. Right. And so he makes that contrast. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, you remember the people that heard him were impressed because he taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And you mm -hmm. see that authority in these mm -hmm. statements. This is what you have heard. Right. This is what I say to you. Now, that's an audacious statement, really, when you think right. about it. Uh, what gives him the right to assert him his own teaching in that way? This is what these great scribes have been teaching through the years. But I'm going to tell you they're all wrong. You need to listen to me. Well, he can say that because <laughs> right. of who he is. He's that's the right. son of God. And, you know, one of the things, and we talked about this at the top of, of the program, uh, a lot of times the contrast is that the Pharisees were focused on the behavior, and Jesus says that's not far enough. If you wait to that point, it's too late. There's already a problem that precedes that. Let's right. go back in time and get the motivation that ultimately led to that behavior. That's right. The first one of these is in verse 21. You've heard that, it, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, mm -hmm. and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And so that's a good illustration of your point. Right, right. Um, it's not enough to sh just to stop short of murder if you're going right. to exceed the righteousness of right, the Pharisees. Right, right. You must control the emotion that right. produces that's right. murder that's as right. well. And so controlling your anger and controlling those emotions or controlling the heart would be right, another right. way of saying that's that, right. controlling the heart. And uh, that's what Jesus is aiming at, and that's what surpasses the mm -hmm. righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Amen. We've talked about anger before, but yeah. you can see the problem with anger in this particular passage. Right. What are some of the things that in the passage that, that result from uh, inappropriate anger? Well, he talks about you can be in danger of the judgment, you could be in danger of the council, and then ultimately you could be in danger of hellfire, eternal damnation. And so it, just, it seems like there's a ratcheting up of yeah. the penalties for letting your anger go uncontrolled. Right. Anger produces insult. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you fool, mm -hmm. you good for nothing. Right. And it's not that Jesus is uh, uh, prohibiting specific words and allowing right, right. other insulting words. Right, right. He's just saying... The, you need to control your anger so that it doesn't break out into that's right other other things as well insulting and then committing murder right and so forth and so if you want to control your speech control your heart that's right you know work on your heart and then if we get our heart right if we pure in heart and so forth like we look looked at in the beatitudes then as you said earlier in our study the behavior will follow naturally. And the other thing I think is interesting, at least in the very beginning, he focuses on your brother, your brother, your brother. So there's this relationship of having brothers and how brothers should be. They should be at peace. They should be trying to resolve disputes. It's so we're going to see in a little bit, it's so important that brethren dwell in unity that, that it really is kind of astounding what he says, how important that is. And he'll talk later about the adversary, which I think is a different relationship than necessarily being your brother. But I do think this idea of you do these things and you're doing it to people who are your brethren, this should not mm. be so. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, verse 23, you know, if you're presenting your offering at the altar mm -hmm. and there, remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother. Right. And then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly yes. with your opponent at law while you're on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, to judge to the officer, and that you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you'll not come out from there until you've paid up the last cent. So the emphasis is on reconciliation, right, right. Uh, making friends, mm -hmm. coming to an agreement. And so we're not overcome by anger or resentment. But we, we want to be, as he says earlier, peacemakers. Right, And right. we want to reconcile. And otherwise, he says, you're going to pay the full price. That's you right. Know, you're going to be judged, and you're going to pay the full price. You know, something that stands out to me, and we were talking about the importance. He talks about if you bring your gift to the altar, obviously for the purpose of worshiping. And a lot of us would say, well, that, that's the higher purpose. And yet he says, no, wait a minute. If there is a problem between you and your brother, you got to pause the worship and get reconciled. It just tells you how important 
having a right relationship with your brother is that you really can't worship as God would have you to worship if you've got this thing, this mm. issue, this animus between you and your brother. And so that should tell us that we need to prioritize being in good relations with our brethren. I mean, you could see this happening in a congregation. Uh, oh, sometimes yeah. you've had congregations that have these feuds with each other and they've been at each other's throats for years about something that happened. Well, you can't worship in good conscience and have those feelings towards your brother. In fact, we know First John, you can't say, now I love God, but I hate my brother. <laughs> you know? yeah. you, you, you've got, I mean, th that's the child of God. If you love God, you must also love his children. And so I just think there's a great emphasis here, as you said, on reconciliation First, be reconciled to your brother. Right. Then you can worship in good conscience. I don't know where I came across it, but years ago, I came across a comment somewhere. You know, you can't be right with God until you're right with your brother. That's right. That's and right. so that's what this passage yeah. is teaching yeah. here. And notice that in verse 23, you remember your brother has something against you. Yeah, right. And right. so it might be that we would think, well, he's got the problem with me. He needs right. to come to me. Right. No, or Jesus says, you go to him. That's right. Later on, Matthew chapter 18. Exactly. So it's almost as if they meet in the middle. That's you know? right. But they're, in Matthew 18 and in this passage, both of those people are trying their best to resolve right. the issue. Right. And and that that's a heart matter, isn't it? It's it not is. harboring resentment or bitterness or you know, making demands of others. Right. I want to do whatever I can to work yeah. this problem out with my brother so that I can worship God uh, with a clear conscience right. and worship God effectively without this you know, barrier between us. And in taking those two passages together, I love that because as you said, you can never sit on the sidelines knowing there's something wrong between you and your brother and say, well, it's his responsibility. Because here he's saying, okay, if you know your brother has something against you, you got to go to him. In Matthew 18, if your brother sinned against you, you still have to go to him. So wherever you are along the spectrum, you have an affirmative obligation to try to make things right. It won't always work. In Matthew 18, it contemplates the possibility that even after you going and taking a couple of witnesses and telling the church, it could be that the person is so unrepentant that the elders have to withdraw from them. But at least you've done your part to try to resolve the problem. That's right. That's right. So if we find ourselves in that situation, you know, we kind of have to work up our courage sometimes. We might have to swallow our pride yeah, yeah. And, and just say, look, let's, let's see what we can do to work this out, even if it means... You know, I, I admit, yes, I was in the wrong, or right. I have to make some concessions. Right. And so we do everything we can, Romans 12, you know, to, exactly. to be at That's peace it. at all men. That's as right. much as in your life, be it. And it doesn't always work out. Right. It Sometimes does. there will be issues that remain. Right. But we don't want those issues to remain because I have failed to make every effort exactly. I can to reconcile them. Amen. Amen. And so um, we need to control our anger. Uh, we need to be have an attitude of, reconciliation and, and resolving conflict, being peacemaker, as Jesus says earlier in the chapter. And, you know, that, that gets us started in developing a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes. Amen. Appreciate Amen. you being with us yes. today. Hope we've said some things that will uh, make us think, make us think about ourselves. And if we need to make some, some changes and adjustments in our thinking, in our lives, uh, maybe we, this will help start us on that way. Amen. Kevin, you want to lead us in prayer? Yeah, sure. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity to study your word. We always enjoy sitting at your feet and hearing what you have to say. We especially appreciate the teaching that Jesus gave, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, so much of which addresses our hearts and how we should think and how we should relate to you and relate to our fellow man. Uh, this particular study we focused on, the idea of exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, as Jesus instructed uh, us to do. And we look specifically in the area of murder and anger and relations with our brethren. Please help us to look within ourselves and examine our relationship with others. And do we have relations with our brethren uh, that are not right, that are not what they should be? And if we find that that's the case, let us have the courage and subordinate the pride to reach out to those individuals and do what we can to make things right. It's just not acceptable to allow weeks and months and years, in some cases decades, to go on with this rift between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's too important for us to be in a right relationship. And, and as you indicated here, it affects our worship of you, our relationship with you. So that is the, the worst aspect of it is if we're not right with the children of God, uh, we cannot be right with you. And so uh, give us the uh, courage and the 
um, value of the relationship to reach out to those that either we've wronged or they've wronged us. Go to them in a spirit of humility, not being caught up in the anger that would result in calling somebody uh, you fool or saying raka or anything of that nature, but but using wisdom, being uh, mindful of the admonition in Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath. See if there's a way that we can get to the heart of the problem and solve it. So many times we find that there are misunderstandings behind those. Maybe we considered a comment that was made meant one thing and they meant something else. But whatever it is, Lord, please let us ha- have the mind of being a peacemaker, a mind of reconciliation, a mind of trying to live peaceably with all men uh, to the best of our ability. We ask you to continue to bless us as we read and study your word. Uh, give us a heart that wants to know more about your will, explores your will. Uh, we thank you for this uh, medium we have to touch so many hearts, so many minds, not only in this city, in this state, in this country, but around the world. We're thankful for those who have tuned in, who are attentive to these things, who value these things, who treasure these things, who take the time to think through these. And we're so very thankful for those who so often, if they're in our social sphere, will give us some words of encouragement. We appreciate that. And that uh, gives us yet another reason to continue to do this work. We hope that good has been done because the word has been exalted and we hope that you've been glorified, uh, Father, in this effort. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.